there are many, many or several uh, key moments in the history of astronomy where suddenly the universe, well, the view of our view of the universe, reshaped, and we are very fortunate that 2017 is one of those key moments. So today I want to take you on a journey through several observations that you know brought us to today, and that way we can see you know how important it is what we just managed to discover, you know how lucky we are. So. As a species, humans have always been very curious about the, about the sky. We, you know, for millennia, we just look up the night sky and we look at the stars. And, you know, we wonder what they were and why they were there, what were, you know, those tiny, tiny points and why they were all grouped uh, that way. And it took us a while, really, to start using technology. And the first thing we did was, you know, building some kind of telescopes, like the one that you have there in the image. And they were, it's still using our eyes somehow, you know, they were sensitive to the same kind of light that our eye can see. Uh, but wow, you know, like we, we open a new kind of astronomy in that moment, you know, suddenly things that we couldn't see with our eyes, suddenly they were there. And, and things look very different and fantastic, you know, a lot of things, you know, started to develop. But then we realized that light is just not just what our eye can see. Light is much more. Today, we talk about radio, we talk about x-rays, we talk about camera rays, and you know, we, we, we use them every day. We harvest it somehow in our daily lives. We use our phones, so that's using some kind of radio uh, light uh, to get the signal. We break our bones, we use x-ray. All that is light. All that is part, something that we call the electromagnetic spectrum and travels at the same speed, speed of light. And so, you know, it's silly that if we use it every day, why not using it for astronomy? Probably the universe is going to be doing something similar. And so, but, you know, like we, we started doing that and the easiest thing from the ground was building radio telescopes. And so we did. 1932, we started building the the first, not this ones in particular, but like this, these big dishes, you know, looking at the, at the radio sky. Again, it's just light, but different type of light. So you would expect something slightly different. And it didn't take that long, you know, something like 50 years, suddenly, boom, we saw something new, something that we hadn't seen before. And of course, you know, once you see something new, what does the press say? Aliens. In this case, we were seeing aliens because we were looking at a periodic signal of a source. We didn't, we didn't know what that source was, but we saw that every 1.7 seconds we got an extra amount of light. Now we call these objects pulsars, and they were discovered in 1967 by uh, Dame Jocelyn Bell uh, while she was doing her PhD. And these objects are amazing. They have the same amount of the, uh, the same mass as the sun, one, or a bit, bit bigger, one 1.5 times the, sol uh, the mass of the sun, but all, all inside of a, it's a sphere of, you know, bubble of just 20, 30 kilometers. You can see it there compared to Manhattan. It's just tiny. So imagine the density of this object. The density is the mass divided by the volume. So the volume of these guys is really, really small, but very massive. So they are very, very dense, and they are made of neutrons. We also call them neutron stars. And of course, again, we were at the aliens. We still didn't know what these objects were. We just saw these objects, you know, spiking, or we saw an increase of, lumino of light. And why is this happening, or how is this happening? Well, it is similar to a lighthouse. Imagine that a lighthouse, you know, you see the beam, and suddenly you see light, and then the light goes off, and then goes on. Well, the same thing happens to these guys. They have a beam of light, a cone of light, and it just passes through the Earth. Now, instead of a, in, in a lighthouse, you would have something like once every 50 seconds, once every 30 seconds. This guy's, this guy's spin 30, 50 times every second, really, really fast. And they are very hot. How hot? Million degrees. You know, something like it's not, you don't want to touch it. You know, it's really hot. <laughs> so, you know, these objects, they were not known before. But we, you know, we had theoretical astrophysicists, and they were like, well, we, we expect them from the death of stars. And you know, we should see something like this. And it took us a little while to put the two together. And it was until we saw one of these pulsars at the heart 
of that nebula. That's the Crab Nebula. And it was seen by the Chinese. We know that the Chinese saw a star exploding in the sky and they started seeing this uh, shaping. So this is essentially a thousand years old star died. A very, very massive star. And if you ask me where is that pulsar in this image, I will tell you I don't know. The reason for that is that it optically is very faint. You will not see it. We do see it, but with the technology and the telescopes that we have today. With the telescopes that we had in the 60s, it was very difficult. We started seeing it, yes, but it took us ages. What we realized is if you put a radio telescope at the center of that, hey, you see that periodic signal. 30 times per second, you see boom, boom, boom a pulsar, you know, beaming you every, you know, constantly. So we managed to put them together. But the only way we managed to do that was by putting radio and optical light together, travel, you know, studying things together. We realized, you know, if you just use only one wavelength, only the light that you can see with your eye, you don't see the full picture. And of course, we go on. And, you know, similar the same year, 1967, we launched the Vela satellites. Now, these weren't satellites for astronomical purposes. These were satellites for mili uh, military purposes. You know, we are in the Cold War, America against Russia, and we, people were testing nuclear weapons, so that would release gamma rays. But what they, what they, did, uh, they didn't expect was that they would detect gamma ray radiation from the sky. This is kind of what we did, they, they saw. A short, bright flash of gamma rays. It could last from milliseconds to a few hundreds of seconds. Now, they, um, they, this is what we call a gamma ray burst. Again, we open a window of gamma rays, uh, of gamma rays, and then a new type of source that we didn't know about, you know, appear, you know, all of a sudden. And, you know, these objects are extremely, extremely energetic. They can emit as much as three times the whole lifetime of the sun. So you would need three suns emitting all the 10 billion years to emit as much as these objects in a fraction of a second or in a few seconds. So they are really, really powerful. Now, if you look at gamma ray bursts just from the gamma ray radiation, well, you're doomed. In 1994, there was a paper actually by a scientist summarizing all the, science, all the, all the different theories. We had 100 of these known GRBs, 100 GRBs, around 200 scientists working on this, and we had 118 theories. We had more theories than GRBs. That's because we were looking just at the gamma ray radiation. As soon as we look at them in x-rays and in optical, oh, wait, now, you know, we, we know more or less what we're looking at. We're looking at the death of a massive star that in particular is, can release this massive amount of energy. What it happens at the end, well, it seems that we are creating a black hole. Oh, way, you know, great. We know what a black hole is, and it's great. And in some particular cases, when this lasts extremely, extremely small amount of time, less than a second, we think that actually it's not a star just dying. It's the two teeny tiny objects, two neutron stars, the same kind of neutron stars that Jocelyn Bell discovered in 1967, merge together. Now, the problem here is by the time they merge, they are, they are gone, and we can't see them. These objects happen so far that we literally can't see them before or after. All we see is the bright flash of light. So essentially, it's like if, if you are a detective, you cannot move from your sight, and someone gets shot and dies, and you can't see who died, who killed it, and so what, what do you do? You just wait for another death, right? You're just a terrible detective and you just wait for, you know, your, your killer to kill and kill and kill and eventually you get some information. So, <laughs> just to give you an idea, back to the Crab Nebula, this is what the Crab Nebula looks like in different wavelengths. You see it's extremely important. This is what we call the multi-wavelength era. That ha that's the kind of era of astrophysics that we've been living until 2017. The era where all the information if you want the total, the whole picture, we thought, well, you, know, you need from radio all the way to gamma rays. You know, that's how you see how different it is, the crap nebula and different wave bands. That's what you need, but that's incomplete. In 2015, LIGO, for the first time, so this is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, that's easier to pronounce, you know, was switch on for the first time. Well, well, we call it the advanced LIGO, was switch on, and two days in, detected the first black hole, black hole merger. Now, to detect these things, ooh, you need really extremely long uh, 
interferometer is long laser, so you, you have a beam of light going in this direction and a beam of light going in that, that direction. The reason for that is gravitational waves, when they're crossing, and they're probably crossing through you right now, they stretch you in one direction and they compress you in the other one. So if you have two perpendicular lasers, you know, one will be stretched and the other one will be compressed. So you can actually see now this, don't worry, you're not being harmed by the gravitational waves. This happens really, really small, and that's why you need to build these gigantic uh, lasers. Now, to think about a black hole, a black hole is a, even a more extreme object than a neutron star, much more denser. If we, want, if we said that a neutron star is more or less the same, the same mass as the sun in a 20 to 30 kilometer diameter, a black hole would have three kilometers for that kind of mass. Now we know of ma more massive black holes, you know, 10, 50 solar masses, so they, they could be a little bit bigger. Just to give you an idea of how dense it could be, if we put, I have to, if we put the mass of Earth, with you included, with me included, the mass of Earth in something like this, we would have a black hole. That's more or less how dense this object, you know, this is extremely light, but if you put the whole Earth, you know, it would be extremely dense. That's the kind of density that a black hole has. Very, very extreme. So they saw the first two black holes merging together. And that's great. You know, that meant that for the first time we were able to harvest gravitational waves for the detection. One thing that we need to realize is in the same way that light travels at the speed of light, gravitational waves travel at the speed of light too. So if we were to, this simulation, this is kind of simulate like if we put a mass there in space, you know, that flick, you can see a wave propagating. So imagine that we were just to create a, a per perturbation in the space-time. It will take some time for that perturbation to, tr to reach us. That is what happens with a gravitational wave. Something happened somewhere in the space, but it takes time to reach us. And in other ways, if you have two black holes orbiting each other, you can see there, you know, it's creating ripples in the space-time, but it, these ripples are traveling at the speed of at the speed of light, so it takes some time to reach us. And that's where we get to 2017. 2017 is the moment where not only we detected gravitational waves, but also we detected light from the same object. So we saw gamma rays, we saw optical, you, see, you can see that arrow over there, we had a source that popped up near a galaxy and then it faded away, and we have the gravitational waves at the same time. In this case, we're back to the neutron stars, two neutron stars merging and forming, well, we think, we, we, don't, we don't know 100%, we're not 100% sure, but it forms something else. But, you know, the importance here is not only we needed the multi-wavelength information, we needed information in gamma rays, we needed information in optical, we needed information in radio and x-rays, but also in gravity with gravitational waves. This is the era of the multi-messenger. Information now is carried by two completely different phenomena, the multi-messenger era. I should mention that for the, the, uh, the creation of all this, Around 3,500 scientists signed a paper summarizing the discover, or this discovery, including five scientists, my, myself one of those from UCD. The next video, the next animation shows you a render of starting with the gravitational wave event, <coughs> go to the gamma ray event, and then the optical, the x-ray, and the, and the radio emission. So we start with the two neutron stars orbiting each other, that will cause eventually, we are seeing the ripples in gravity, that's causing the gravitational waves. They will collapse, emerge, and form a new object. We have the gamma ray radiation, really short flash. We have the optical here emerging, going from blue to red. And then we have this kind of like mushroom shape uh, of X-rays and radio emission. So all that render, all that video, it's a combination, again, of multi-messenger uh, multi um, multi uh, information, gravity and optical and gamma rays and radio and X-ray multi-wavelength, the two together. That's the future. That's where we are going now. In the history books, it'll say 2017, the first time we had that kind of full picture. We had a movie with sound, 3D, color. We had the whole package. Now. Why do we call it a gold rush? Well, because inside of a star we can create all the way up to the blue things, but what about the rest of the elements, including gold, silver, 
platinum? Well, they are formed in this kind of uh, merger mergers. So we tested, and finally we know, you know, we've seen it, we've seen the proof, they are formed here. So what did they form? Well, we don't know. It's two, in the top you have black holes, at the bottom we have neutron stars, in the middle there in orange you have the mergers, and we don't know what it formed. You know, probably a light neutron star, a heavy neutron star, or a light black hole, maybe something in between. So just with this, you know, it probably opened up a new era, it opened up a new era, and it probably opened up a new type of source, maybe not, but this is just the beginning. We just explore a teeny tiny part of the gravitational wave. We will go bigger, we will get more detectors, and maybe there will be a new source like we've seen in other wavelengths. So thank you very much. Thank you.